This is Dr. Turan. We are here again with Pastor James McCarroll from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Welcome back. Hey, it's good to be back. I'm excited about tonight. Me too. I'm like, we left off with so many things to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just like so many amazing things that we were discussing in regards to servant leadership. And we're just continuing that discussion. I want to do just a really brief recap that we were looking at and we focused on the person of character. And these are the seven pillars. Person of character, someone that puts people first, and someone that is a skilled communicator. And we left off with those three, the other seven pillars of servant leadership include someone that is a compassionate communicator, someone that is a compassionate collaborator, someone that has foresight, someone that is a systems thinker, and someone that leads with moral authority. So I just wanted to recap that for my listeners. If you didn't have a chance to watch the first episode or listen, to the first episode on the podcast. You can definitely feel free to revisit the first part one of servant leadership and why we're talking about Jesus. But today, before we go into what we're gonna be talking about, I just want to have another introduction of our guest, Pastor McCarroll, to just again, share a little bit about yourself. We are so excited to have you. Absolutely. So my name is James McCarroll. I serve as the pastor at First Baptist Church here in the beautiful city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I'm a native of Nashville. Uh, I uh, was blessed to be able to serve the congregation I serve and to not only work there, but work throughout the community and work through different business ventures uh, to just serve the people around me. And so it's just been a, an absolute privilege and such a wonderful growth opportunity uh, as a leader. And so it's just a privilege and, and, and I'm excited tonight to be sharing with Dr. Turan. It's about to go down. So I guess my last little nugget about me is I am on tiptoe anticipation of yes. what we're going to see happen tonight and what you're going to experience tonight. Absolutely. We are, again, so honored to have you. And I, I just can't say it enough. Like, I'm super excited. And we have been talking about you guys not having to listen to me only for the rest of this month to finish out this discussion about servant leadership and the ministry of Jesus. So I'm going to let it come straight from the horse's mouth. What are we yes. doing the rest of this month? So man, we're <laughs> going to, we're going to move this from a two part conversation to a four part conversation, just so we yes. can fit it all in. I think last week we felt like an overweight woman trying to wear her high school jeans. We just, we couldn't get it to fit in. We couldn't get it all in. So so with that being the case, we just figured we'd expand the waistline uh, and make more room for the conversation. Just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Squeeze it on in there, but have a little bit of breather room, right? Right, right. <laughs> so we, again, we're so excited. And today, just so that you guys know, the title of today, even though we are gonna cover you know, some more, we don't have to rush now, but we're gonna cover some more of those qualities of a servant leader. The title for today is, we're still in crisis. The pandemic continues. And as we talk about that, I just wanted to share the overview of the essence of what we're gonna be talking about is that we're continuing to forge ahead, right? Through this ongoing pandemic while Many leaders are still trying to figure it out. They haven't figured out how to bounce back. And bouncing back is really bouncing forward to spring ahead, I should say, um, knowing the changes that are going on. And when there's this consistent evolution, there's this consistent change, I want us to be able to collaborate in our thoughts surrounding this about those key pillars of servant leadership and how to use this leadership model to help heal, to help bring peace and to help the organizations as they are going through this transition. 
So that's really what we're going to be talking about as we pull in some more pieces since we don't have to stuff it all in. So So one of the things that I, I just want to start us off on is a lot of leaders, and I want to say this really plainly, a lot of leaders are not only still dealing with the pandemic, but they're also dealing with the civil unrest. There's a lot going on where leaders are still trying to cultivate their groups. And it's been concerning and it puts a question mark in my mind of the readiness, um, Mm. which does speak to the servant leadership like pillar of foresight. Yeah. And so you're trying to figure things out to help balance the workforce with the pandemic. But now we have these ongoing issues of race relations, the highlight of inequality that has continued to grow and how pervasive it is at this point. So let's just sort of like, just jump right into it. Some of the things that come up for you about the servant leadership style, the ministry of Jesus, in the times that we're in. Yeah, so when we talk about the the, the servant leadership style, especially with foresight, mm-hmm. uh, Greenleaf does a great job kind of mm-hmm. talking through this. Uh, and he talks about the leader that really has to see through two different lenses. Mm-hmm. On one hand, he has to see through the lens of specifically what's going on as, in his immediate context. Mm-hmm. But then he also has to have this much more transcendent uh, macrocosmic lens where he has to be able to see the ebb and flow of times, both that are, as well as those that have been and shall be. Mm-hmm. And so when we see this part of the challenge of the servant leader is number one, y- your heart is designed to serve others. And mm-hmm. there's one element of service that was already present, but now you're dealing with a much more transcendent, uh, a much harder area of servanthood while you're already in a space where you have been, for lack of a better term, depleted from the, while you know depleted from the the, pri- the previous one, so mm-hmm. so there's this this juxtaposition, if you will, in leaders right now, in any leader, where you have to now address this new fire. It's like being in a house that's on fire, whether mm-hmm. whether the basement's on fire, then all of a sudden you have a grease fire, and you're like, oh yeah. gosh, you know. Yeah. And so so it's it's one of those things where we have to begin to ask the question of how do we, how do we deal, you know, what's going on in each fire? So the first thing is realizing or recognizing the source of each fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, So all fire is not the same. And so I think the challenge with many leaders in this time has been uh, wrestling with this now internal piece that puts all of my leadership and my, not only my leadership, but my morality, morality in the question to say, okay, have I really been unfair? Uh, have I really been in a space where I've looked down, whether knowingly or unknowingly, on an mm-hmm. entire group of people or several groups of people, and I'd have to now deal with this fire while still dealing with the other. And yeah. so as the servant leader, I think uh, one, one thing that's stated is that you always have to find out what is the, the, the area of greatest priority, uh, yeah. what is the issue of greatest priority. And I think in this space, one is a global tragedy the other is a domestic tragedy yeah. which threatens the immediate team so the servant leader is always asking where is what is the best service they can provide in that moment yeah and and sometimes a, a great case in point with jesus i think jesus just did it masterfully is mm-hmm. when this woman comes to him the syrophoenician woman comes to him while he's on vacation in tyre and sidon they're sitting back here and the disciples are chilling and this mm-hmm. woman comes into the room and she says you know, my daughter's sick with a de- with a demon. Yeah. And Jesus says, look, I'm not even sent to you. Like this isn't even a fight that we're going, it's not even a conversation we need to have. I'm not sent to you. I'm right. sent to the children of Israel. So do I take the kids bread and now give it to the dogs? So now we see two distinct cases of servant leadership or, mm-hmm. or, or opportunities for servants, for service. One is he has to deal with this larger picture picture of bringing salvation to the Israelite nation. But then yeah. in his immediate purview, He's got this woman uh, that is clearly sick. And now this is more of a socio-political issue. 
So, right. you know, he has to wrestle between the two. And I think many leaders are in that space. And what he does is this, he's, he realizes, okay, there's gonna be an immediate need I have to address. Mm -hmm. And this, the longer term need is just that. I won't be able to fully address it in that time, but this is a need I can address in the moment. And I think most servant leaders have to ask the question, where, where can I serve most, most powerfully in the immediate moment while simultaneously not throwing away the greater service that has to be rendered in the larger moment. And so I think it's just a space where as, as servant leaders, we really have to address uh, the race piece because here's the big piece, that affects the team that will be serving the larger picture. Right. And so we have to be able to, to make sure the team is all on one accord as so that we can address the larger issue uh, at hand uh, on, with a unified front. And so as a servant leader, again, it's always identifying where is the most pressing, most immediate and most urgent service uh, needed so that the greater service can be done. And I think with every leader, we have to ask that question, what's immediate and then what is the greater service and how do we address that immediate so that we together uh, can then address our greater service? Well, to play a little bit of devil's advocate a little bit is okay. the question of how do we do it all? You know, how is it that we're addressing all of this and giving it its full attention in the midst of the chaos? How? Well, it's, it's how? It's hard. Like you tell me, honestly, you have to choose the battle you're going to fight today while never forgetting the war that's at hand. Mm. Say that again. So you have to choose the battle you're going to fight today while never forgetting the war that's at hand. And I think sometimes it's just, you have to realize that a war is won battle by battle. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to, to, to determine what's, what's today's battle. Mm -hmm. And you spend your energy on that battle. So just, you know, conquering the one thing that's in front of you, then going to the next thing, going to the next thing. And ultimately, in time, uh, the overall concern uh, gets handled. Yeah. And I, I think of that even when we speak of going back to the drawing board. <laughs> what is the vision? What is the yes, mission? Yes. You know, and I think that when you say that, my mind goes to the space of, well, if you are making sure that you're staying firm on a mm -hmm. clear vision, on a clear foundation, it's mm -hmm. easy to say, like you said, what is the bigger, what's the bigger war? And the yeah. bigger war for some people is to maintain organizational health because organizational mm -hmm. health mm -hmm. is what helps drive uh, productivity, provides um, employee engagement, employee health, customer satisfaction, all of those things that are, um, in some ways a checkbox, but actually really necessary, you know? Yes. And you can't allow, like you said, the, the main goal to be lost, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. ultimately the goal is still to get back there. And yes. I think that, um, and tell me if you agree, I think that a lot of the stress, a lot of the confusion, a lot of the unsettledness in making a move and making a decision on what you're working on is because there's a foundational issue. Where's the foundation? Do you know where you're going back to so that you know how to lead the now? What do you think yes. of that? Yes, and so, so to your point, you're exactly right. Um, if you're not clear on the why, mm -hmm. then you have a hard time wrestling with the what, the how, the <laughs> when, and the where. Yeah, and 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 so, you know, I, I think you know when we talk about servant leaders, it begins with being clear on the why. Mm -hmm. The thing I love about Jesus is Jesus didn't come with a foggy why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was clear. He was clear on why he was here. He was here to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't mm -hmm. come to condemn man, but that everyone through him should be saved. He was clear on his why. Mm -hmm. And so when, when a person like a Peter comes up and says, no, you shouldn't go to the cross, he can say clearly, get behind me. In other words, man, you're not clear on the why. Right. And I was <laughs> no. just about to say that. I was just like, that also is a factor when people are questioning it. You know, you have, especially depending on the size of your organization, yes. you have everyone questioning, well, what you're going to do? Are you going to do this? 
this organization is doing that, this organization is doing that. But if you're not clear, you can't come back to the space of this is where we're going. Just like you yes. said, within the ministry of Jesus, he was very clear. Anytime there was a distraction, anytime mm -hmm. it was a question, it was, let me ask you a question if you're asking me, <laughs> you yes. know? And I love that about that, the, the ministry style and even his, his yeah. response, it was, well, what do you say? You know, what yes. is it that you're really asking me? You know, yes. that came up because he was so sure. And it was more of, let me try to figure out what you're trying to communicate with me by asking me the question that if I'm not firm in my foundational, you know, my, my vision, my mission, yes. my purpose, yes. that I can, you know, just easily just turn the other way when no, that will lead to the detriment of the plan, you know? So yes. go you're ahead. exactly right. It's um, if you're not clear on the service you're called to render, mm -hmm. your life will be spent either as an extension of someone else's calling, a carbon copy of someone else's assignment or a smoke screen for someone else's agenda. Wow. <laughs> And so when you talk about being a servant, yeah. when you talk about any area of servant leadership, especially in, in leadership of large organizations, mm -hmm. if you're not clear, and you'll see this in the, in the life of Jesus, you had certain groups that used them as a smoke screen mm -hmm. because they didn't want people seeing what they did that was wrong. So they would bring up a bunch of questions to divert the attention away from themselves. Right. Or, or you'll, you'll become a carbon copy of someone else's calling because you're not clear, you end up now adopting the calling of someone that looks to be successful based upon their highlight reel. Yeah. yeah. Or number three, you become an extension of someone else's calling. You literally spend your life being the ornament to someone else's vision. Yeah, yeah. And most, most leaders in times like these, this is where, you know, everyone, it's kind of like being in a ship that's in a storm and you have 50 different ways to save yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're not sure of who you are and what you're called to do and which direction you're called mm -hmm. to go, you, you'll just listen for the best possible thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with benchmarking. Let me, let me articulate that. Yeah. But benchmarking is for the purpose of adopting healthier methods for a direction you already have headed. Okay. So it's not meant to, to fully adopt the why of another person is to adopt the mechanisms and the methods that may make your journey where you're heading a little mm -hmm. bit easier. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so for us, I think in this in this season, the hardest thing is, and it's gonna be so mean to say, Doc, so mean <laughs> to say, like the hardest thing is we have to be honest about number one, whether or not we really are clear on where we were heading in the first place. Number two, the level of foresight, innovation, and creativity we mm -hmm. lacked. Yeah. And then number three, no Baptist preachers, I always have three. So number mm -hmm. three <laughs> is we have to be honest about what we don't know. Right. And that's right. hard in leadership, especially, and I think Greenleaf mentions it, when everyone's asking you, where do we go? Yeah. What's next? And, and, and this season, I'm speaking with a leader the other day, this season has been like trying to saddle and, and ride the wind effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was uh, trying to look up. Um, there was a top executive of a major brand. I don't want to miss, you know, say the name of the brand, but there was a major executive who recently stepped down because she said she realized that she is not the one, even though she did deny having any racist thoughts mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. uh, racist beliefs, prejudice, um, that she wasn't the one to lead the charge towards an anti-racist culture wow. in the organization. She stepped down. And yeah. just to your point too, I pulled up, there was a point I wanted to highlight too, when it talks about servant, leader, servant leaders having concrete skills. That's what Greenlee mm -hmm. was mentioning. And mm -hmm. something that he said, I wanted to quote from his, um, his book on the seven pillars of leadership. 
Mm -hmm. practicing the wisdom of leading by serving. It says the seven pillars of servant leadership also represents a portal to mm. plus extra. Mm. <laughs> the mm. farther beyond landscape for successfully leading an organization in the 21st century. Mm. Mm. They lure us towards a vision, a voyage of discovery beyond the known world of linear mm. management and isolated heroic leaders into the flat world <laughs> of global business, connectivity, shared leadership, mm. and the kind of community that makes it all worthwhile. And yes. what stands out to me is the plus ultra. <laughs> mm. So mm. basically he's saying, you know, from what you're saying, highlighting the fact that when it's all said and done, you have to have more than the enough that people say you need to be in a role or a position, you know? Yes. You have to have more than that, right? Yes, yes. But, but, but to your point, this is the difference between a servant that becomes a leader and just a leader that has a responsibility of serving people. Come on, talk more about that. A, a servant has rewired themselves to give beyond comfort. Mm -hmm. and to give beyond convenience and yep. so when you put that type of person in leadership they don't measure the service they're giving per se they give they well they don't they don't i don't say this they don't measure the service that they render against what they should be giving or how much it's costing them they measure their service their service by whether or not the job is done mm-hmm yeah. And that means if what it takes is more than I am comfortable giving to get the job done, then I'll make it happen. Right. A person that, that grabs just principles of leadership and is thrown into a position where they're called to serve will always measure their service by their level of comfort and convenience. Absolutely. And you will always hear about how much it costs them. And isn't that crazy? <laughs> that to me is something that that almost fuels the exact opposite of what we're talking about with servant leadership mm -hmm. when we're talking about humility, right? Yes. <laughs> it's the exact thing where you're expecting, okay, well, it's, it's the tit for tat. I yes. put forth this much, so this is what you need to give me back. Yes. That but doesn't make always, any sense. But they're gauging their leadership. They're always looking at how much they give. Yeah. And how much and how much they're getting for what they give. Yeah. Versus giving themselves full availability to the God that gave them the privilege to serve. Right. And asking, Lord, is there more that I can give? So so um, Matthew Kelly in this book, Rhythm of Life, mm -hmm. states this. He states that when you talk about excellence, mm -hmm. the person that that specializes in excellence always asks the question, what's the most that I can give? Mm hmm. And I think that those leaders that go to those top tiers and really see the top 5%, if you will, and the heights of leadership that are reserved for those that, that bring the diligence and the sacrifice and those skills you're talking about, mm -hmm. they are always asking, what's the most I can do? Right. And that's, that's the heart of a servant. Mm -hmm. is, and, is there more I can do? And I think, and I want you to share a little bit more on what you think about, if we were to look at uh, um, the quality of the compassionate collaborator. Mm -hmm. That's one of the pillars of a servant leader. And when we talk about the ministry of Jesus and his collaborations in order to execute, you know, because I feel like if you have help and you allow the help, mm -hmm. you won't be so inclined to a tit for tat mentality. It mm. helps with the humility because you know, out the gate, I can't do this alone. Yes. So in comparison to the, the ministry of Jesus, how was Jesus a compassionate collaborator as well? Yeah, so when you talk about, we talked last week about the fact that servant leaders serve at three levels. Mm -hmm. They serve the God that called them, mm -hmm. they serve their coworkers, and they serve the people to whom they're called. Mm -hmm. 
that second piece is so huge because again, if you're not careful, you'll think these people are the ornaments of your calling. Yeah. And so what Jesus does is Jesus, he notices that, that for some reason, the disciples don't get it. Every time he turns around, they're talking about who's going to be the greatest. Yeah. You yeah. Know, this guy says, I'm <laughs> going to be the greatest guy, you know? So Jesus says, okay, they don't get it. He, he has three or four clear cut, you know, seminars for them on what it means to be a servant. <laughs> I didn't come to be served. You're misreading my leadership. Yeah, he had these yeah. sessions, but then he says, okay, let me just, let me just do this differently. He says, I'm going to give you just a seminar, but it's going to be a seminar through sign language. And okay. he, he pulls this tile out, takes off his <laughs> outer robe, gets on his knees, fills a basin up with water, puts it at their feet and says, okay, let me, I can show you better than I can tell you. Right. And he, and he doesn't say anything. He doesn't, give this deep dialogue on it. He just does it. Mm -hmm. And they see this guy that's a miracle worker that, you know, literally calling, telling the water to be quiet and the water shuts up. Like this guy that's healed everything, right. watching people with no hands, have hands grown back. And this dude that, that is the man, right? Their, their chief leader gets on his knees and does what the lowest servant in the house would have done. Wow. And, and what he's showing them is, this is how we work with our coworkers. Yeah. That that you serve the people that are working alongside you. But now here's the, in our day and time, here's the element. It's I realize that your calling is never meant to be an ornament on mine. It's meant to be authentically great in its own right. Right. And right. so I spend that energy helping you cultivate what you're called to do and who you're called to be so that we fulfill the plan of God. We so, fulfill the assignment, the corporate assignment that's in front of us. And so and, a servant leader delegates for the purpose of making sure a person becomes who they were called and created by God to be. And that's what I was just about to highlight. If we were to step into the, the office, okay? Mm -hmm. The office as we formerly known it, pre-Rona. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because some people may be home and that's their office. Yeah. But the office formerly known, when I think of times where there are a lot of talent, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about talent in respects to whether it's this person may be skilled in communications. Mm -hmm. but they're over there um, just scheduling appointments, yes, making phone calls, but yet they can do something bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And then we look at, we're in this crisis, we're in this pandemic, and we're looking for resources. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we be intentional enough to have a clear mindset and say, you know what, and this brings in innovation, we may yes. not have normally, you know, cross-trained. We may mm -hmm. not have normally made sure that you know how to do this job or that job. But when yes. you're talking about humility and really letting people shine and serve in that capacity, that is something that people can consider when they're trying to manage all of the different fires that are going on during this pandemic. Mm. Okay, there are situations that you may not know how to address, but in your gut, you may feel, yeah, I need to address it in regards to mm. race relations or support to staff so that they can mm. continue to have psychological safety for both the peace about their health and well being because of COVID and the peace and well being because of discrimination, uh, unconscious yes. bias and all of that, right? And it's like, how easy could it be to really highlight people's strengths? And that to me is a, mm. is a compassionate collaborator that you're saying, hold yes. on, I know I can't do it, humility. I can't mm -hmm. do it all, but I yes. know that there's a lot to be done. So let's have a conversation. Just like you said, you gotta address it. You got to yeah. address the elephants that are now in the room, right? It's not just what some of us, and I just say the whole community of people of color, and even those that were allies, or um, I'd say Latin, what is it, Latin allies, those that, mm -hmm. you know, didn't really know how to speak up, that wanted to yes. speak up, 
that are now in this place to really rise up and fit the bill to serve as well from their 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 key you know genius you know yes. their their purpose you know and being allowed to do that yes. because you have a leader that is aware that they can have more impact in numbers which i know jesus did as well he even yeah. though he had to teach and try to help you know like you said make it plain by example mm -hmm. to his disciples he still was like look you can do this you can do that yes. you know let me strengthen this and you you may think you know you have a stutter but let me know what other power you let me let yes. me tell you what other power you have you know yes yes so, so with Jesus, to your point, with Jesus, there was a Peter and Simon, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when Jesus meets Simon, he also can detect Peter. Now, explain that a little bit for our listeners okay. that, so, that aren't so, as versed in that. So one of, one of Jesus' disciples was named Simon. Okay. He was Simon, son of a man uh, named Jonah. So that's his original, you know, Jewish name. Jesus gives him a nickname of Peter, which means rock. Now, Simon means, um, kind of means shift, if you will. Uh, Peter means rock. So Jesus sees this guy that is a fisherman and he, he goes to him and he says, man, I want to make you a fisher of men. Mm -hmm. So he sees this entirely different calling on a guy that's absolutely settled in his profession. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. He sees an entirely different calling on a guy that's settled in his profession. Yeah. And so often as leaders, we have to have the insight of Jesus to be able to see when there's a Peter, this fisher of man inside of this Simon, who's a fisherman. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they, like you said, they may be an administrative assistant or a typist, or they may be a person that is a clerk, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to see and look closely enough and listen closely enough to identify those other elements mm -hmm. that they may have been sent to that office to bring. And so part of it is understand that when, when we get an assignment, when God gives us an assignment, whether it's in a corporate office, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a social group, the, the assignment is usually bigger than the present or seemingly present resources, yeah. which indicates that there's something in the house that has yet to be discovered. Yeah. And yeah. so when Jesus calls these guys, Jesus changes the world, but only calls 12 guys. Watch this. God builds a team. And he builds a team because he understands that the ministry is going to exceed mm -hmm. his own capacity to carry it out. Yeah. And so whenever the calling is there, God will always give you a God-sized calling so that as a leader, you can now call forth the yeah. very competencies that exist, but may exist under the surface or behind the scenes or behind the veil of yeah. the current assignment. Yeah. And so each of us as leaders, we do have to do them. We have to. Uh, we have to take the time to, to be a compassionate uh, teammate, a compassionate co-laborer. And mm -hmm. what that means is, you know, again, being willing to listen and, and being willing to pay attention to what people actually bring. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget as a pastor, you know, we had a lady that was uh, sitting out in the pews and mm -hmm. she loved coming to church every Sunday, had a good time. And yeah. I, I, at the time, our choir was, was the best. We were probably on a scale of one to 10, a strong two and a half. Uh, yeah. we, they were not that great. So one day we're talking and now she's a great member, you know, chilling. Uh, she decides to become an usher. So mm -hmm. she's an usher doing a great job ushering. Yeah. And through conversation, we find out she has a master's degree in music. <laughs> and she's she's been a choir director. She's yeah. written music. She's done all of this stuff, been a composer. And this is her gift, but she's an usher. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we, we can have people that aren't necessarily displaced, but they're not operating in a way that it reflects their full capacity. Yeah. And I think yeah. to your point, Doc, you're exactly right. The servant leader is always so adamant about serving the greater need yeah. that they're constantly looking to elevate the service of the people around them right. in a way that's in alignment with their truest calling right. and their richest right. calling. And the thing is, going back to when I was asking the question of, so how do we get this done? How are we uh, able to strategically, 
because that that's the key. How do we strategically deal with the battle that's in front of us without forgetting about the war that's at hand? And I think it's by tapping into the resources of the people. And we spoke last week about how one of the first, I think it's the second pillar of servant leadership is putting people first, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and putting mm -hmm. people first isn't just, oh, I'm going to say hi and make sure I'm being nice. No, it's, it's, it's being intentional. Yes. It's being yes. intentional. And something that is also um, mentioned by, it's James, James Sipe and Don Frick of this. Um, and it's saying servant leaders help others meet their highest priority mm. and development needs. So mm. it's, it includes seeks first to serve, but yes. inspire them to lead. So you're aspiring other leaders, right? Like you're not just saying, hey, I want you to be down here and uh, I'm just gonna be really nice to you. No, you're tapping into the leadership capabilities of each person because it's also based on their innate desire to serve yes. as well, right? And it's yeah. like, you know, the self-interest is deeply connected to the needs and interests of others and serves in a manner that allows those served to grow. Well, here, it goes back to, but it goes back to John Maxwell's point in mm -hmm. his book, uh, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, where he talks about the law of the lead and that the organization can never grow beyond its top person. Yeah. And so in, in what you just stated, it's inherently believed that the person actually has the capacity and has the, the internal framework or moral framework to see people as capable, to see yeah. everyone as capable. The, the challenge with this new dialogue on, on race is that people have to go back to their core frameworks. Mm -hmm. And so they have to ask, how am I wired? Yeah. You know, so this is more than whether or not you're actually capable, yeah. it's whether or not I'm even perceptive enough to consider you as capable. Right. And so does my right. awareness of the moment and of your life include your capacity and ability to handle the responsibility? Right. And so for so many leaders, we've been wired in a, in a larger culture, for, by a larger culture that historically limited the perception of certain groups. And so when I get okay. into leadership, I bring my culture to yeah. that leadership platform. And so I think the first real place is the, is the really is to ask the question, where have I put a straight jacket on my perception? Right. right. Or my awareness? Have I, have I actually looked within the sea if I'm limited in my worldview? Now, and if, when, and you, if, when you go there though, you're asking people to um, face the truth. Mm. You're asking people to say, okay, wait a minute. Okay, we're talking about servant leadership now, but hold on. Just like you mentioned last week, it comes right back full circle to say, what's in your wallet? Yeah. How about that? But so he, but here's the rough part. Like here's you, this is so good tonight. We should do this for like four hours at a time. But like the hardest part is is when if if the if the person at the top does see it in their worldview, mm -hmm. but the person they're trying to encourage does it. Now we have the same issue, but the weight of it is yeah. from the other side, and so. Yeah. It's, it's a total, again, it's the law of the lead. Now the upside to it is that leader can over time develop that person to their highest potential. Right. But in some right. cases, if they're hardwired enough, they will actually relegate themselves to, low to laying in low places and plateauing their own potential because they can't see it within. And mm -hmm. if that leader's not skilled as a communicator, 
and cannot effectively, and I know we talked about it a little bit last week, can't yeah. effectively articulate and translate that person's skill set and their potential to them, then they may run them off. And that person will go to find another place where they will be allowed to find peace lying in low places. Well, let's turn just a little bit to that corner because guess what? You just brought up another issue. What if the leader that could otherwise be a servant leader mm -hmm. is self-doubting their potential? Like you said, people can only raise themselves as high as the person that's leading them because the leader is supposed to be the one helping raise them up. If they're not helping them raise up, it's just like um, passively, not purposely, like growing your organization, right? Yes. So yes. it's not on purpose, but you end up inadvertently and some purposely, unfortunately, mm -hmm. snuff the growth of those that are following them. But what Absolutely. if the inadvertent snuffing of someone else's growth is because you haven't realized your potential and so you're yes. stuck? Yes, you're, you're exactly right. It's, I'll tell you, and, and I'll speak from personal experience, mm -hmm. so, I, so I'm not putting anyone, anyone else out there. Like I know for the first probably six years of leading mm -hmm. the church I serve. I questioned whether or not I was good enough. Mm. I, I didn't know whether or not I was good enough to actually lead a large body of people. Okay. I figured because I'd never seen a church that large, yeah. I had no point of reference. And so I had every reason to doubt that it yeah. would only grow, that it would grow beyond a certain point. Yeah. And so because I felt that in in a, you know, I want to I want to so badly say mm -hmm. involuntarily, but it was really me choosing yeah. to see only so far. Yeah. And what happened is because of my short sightedness or my lack of confidence, mm. the organization suffered. Mm. And I think there are a lot of leaders out there that that are leading different organizations or different businesses. And you really wonder whether or not you're good enough to go to the next level. Yeah. And so what happens is you only serve, you sabotage the service, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because you're only going to serve to the point that you can see yourself becoming. Right. And and, the, and <laughs> you're right, man. There's so many organizations. I wish, again, I wish we had like, I'm going to bump it up to five hours, five hours to do <laughs> justice on any one part of these, you know, but, Look, but I, I say that stay because tuned. there are so many people that are on here that are like, <laughs> yeah. that are like, I, I want to be better, but yeah. I inherently can't see myself yeah. or see the business I have becoming better. I was speaking with an entrepreneur earlier today mm -hmm. and she was talking about people she was inviting into her realm of business and the, and the people she was inviting couldn't see it. Either yeah. they couldn't see themselves working that much. They couldn't see themselves being as successful. They couldn't see themselves mm. operating certain equipment. And so they were literally sabotaging their own businesses and choosing to stay small because yeah. small seemed to suit them better. Yeah, there's a, a comfort and not even a comfort in being small, right? I don't mm. think anyone finds comfort in that, especially because we were created to be great. Yes, We were created yes. to be in the likeness of someone that's bigger and greater, right? Yes. Yes. There's comfort in what they know. Yes. It's the unknown that's uncomfortable. I don't know if I'm going to do well. I don't know if I'm going to succeed. If I succeed, then what next? You know, I yes. don't, it's, it's a stuck point and it's yes. a matter of getting beyond that because Self-doubt is literally just that. It's just you doubting yourself. It has nothing to do with reality. You know, yes. it has nothing to do with reality. It's just you and your mind and the mm -hmm. opposition for the success that you're supposed to succeed, the growth mm. that you're supposed to obtain. It's really just to mm. keep you small. Because mm. again, if we were created in a certain person's likeness, yes we're supposed to be big and grand 
in our own space, which is why yes. when I'm working with people, I'm just like, you need to figure out the mindset first. We yes. gonna work through yes. this mindset thing because someone needs you. It yes. may not be what, you know, Pastor McCarroll is doing. It may not yeah. be what Dr. Turan is doing, but there's yeah. something in you, because we were talking about purpose, that mm -hmm. is supposed to be driven and put in the forefront. And all of us were to lead in our purpose. So yes. regardless, you know, going back to how to lead when you're not in charge, mm -hmm. that's implying either way, you're supposed yes. to lead. But here's the thing, you're still, we're all leaders. Yeah. We all are given an, an, a specific, uh, individually based assignment. Mm -hmm. you, no one is responsible for that but you. Yeah. No one is going to be held accountable for that but you. Yep. And so the, the freedom of the mind is so pivotal in the pursuit of the purpose. Your legs will never outrun your mind. Your calling will never outperform what's, going, what's in your head. Yep. Like you have to be able to see it, even if you can't fully see it, which goes back to foresight. Yep. So it, it's, it's this concept that I have to be able to see beyond. Yeah. And, yep. and people will only, they will follow you only to the extent that you can see beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it you, man, you're right on, man. You're talking <laughs> tonight. This is like, you're really I'm on. Just, it's, 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 it's really something that comes from experience just like you said like yeah. where you've been in a place where you've been unsure mm -hmm. and it's because of the impact that you were going to make it's like you have to get beyond that and that is that growing that is that um cultivating and growing into you know your purpose that is yes. necessary and it's for a certain reason because of the people that you will impact the people yes. that you will serve, that you need mm -hmm. to have that experience for yourself so that then you can say, I've been there, right? Yes. Just like yes. for myself, it's like, how about imposter syndrome? Same mm -hmm. difference. Like, okay, I'm a doctor. I literally had to go talk to somebody and have them tell me, Sinead, you're a doctor. So of course mm -hmm. you know. And I'm wow. just like, it didn't feel that way. I was second guessing everything. Wow. And it wow. was like, but you studied this for years and people wow. like, I literally was confusing the mm. battle that was preparing me for the level of humility that I needed yes. to have. I was confusing that with the not taking ownership mm. for my greatness. It wow. was, oh no, no, no. I wouldn't even let people call me doctor. Wow. I would wow. tell you, just call me Shanae. Yeah. Just call yeah. me Shanae. That's too much pressure. That's too much yeah. pressure. <laughs> but it's the, it's the fear of success. Like right. you, and you said it best, like we we're scared of what we will possibly have to do mm -hmm. when we do become. Yeah. Because yeah. If, especially if you've been in a space or you've grown up in a space where you've never seen a person become. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or seeing the person become at that level. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so that, that the, the conversation of it, the, the intimidation of it, if I can mm -hmm. use that word is, is there because most of our lives are lived out from hurt echoes of our past yeah. instead of the, the hope echoes of our future. Right. Right. Yeah. And so we, we've, we've spent time rehearsing what we can't do yeah versus buying into who we're called to become and right. and we sab the worst part is we sabotage and in in short sap short changing ourselves mm -hmm. we really sabotage the outcomes of people that we're called to serve like you said right. right and and so i think there comes a point where each of us has to ask our, ourselves mm -hmm. what do the people we're called to serve lose right if we choose to shrink back. Yes, because I just was reading something about how it is necessary. And I want to put this out there as a recommendation for any of those that are wanting to adopt the servant leadership model or even enhance it and grow it in this particular area about being like all of, all of the 
the pillars actually. But the point that you made me think of was realizing that it's bigger than you. Mm -hmm. That's how you deal with that. <laughs> you begin yeah. to, when you have that self doubt, and I'm not going to give you all the secrets too, because you know when it's all said and done, we're going we're going to play this out for you. But yeah. you have to realize that what you're doing and your purpose in serving, and again, this is different from the role, different from the position. It mm -hmm. is your purpose in being a leader. Is you're leading a group that is bigger and has more meaning than the self doubt or the. Yes negative thought patterns and the negative self-talk, all those things that comes into your mind. And so as leaders, when you're dealing with crisis, when you're dealing about with the stress, you have to also consider this, and this is from the psychology end of things. Your mind as an individual human being is naturally wired to think of the stress response. Yes, yes. Fight, yes, yes. flight, yes. or freeze. So mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. to, first of all, like we said, check on yourself first, because yes. if you're in any of those spaces, guess what is the result of any of those avenues? If you're fighting, mm -hmm. you're not moving. You're just in the fight. If you're yes. flighting or fleeting, you're not moving forward. If you're freezing, yes. you're not moving, obviously. But either Absolutely. way, there's no progress. So you have to yes. get yourself, find what you need to find, self-care, come talk to me, get some therapy, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, <laughs> get some coaching and get out of that stress response because you need to be in a forward movement, foresight response, yes. leading people, thinking about the future, not shutting your mind down to try to cope in the moment. That's where it becomes challenging. That's where it becomes difficult because you're sitting there stuck in your own personal fight, flight, or freeze mode. Yes. You yes. have to move forward. Yes. And 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 to know to, to your point, uh, in this book, The Happiness Hypothesis Hypothesis, mm -hmm. Jonathan Haidt makes it a point to state that, like you said, to pay attention to the negative is natural. Mm -hmm. It's survival instinct. Yeah. It's, we're going to highlight certain things mentally because it keeps us safe. Mm -hmm. So that means that to pursue the other, to pursue the positive, to pursue the potential has to be intentional. Yeah. And so there is it, the, the big dreams going after that is it's not going to happen by, by chance. You mm -hmm. have to make it a point to rewire your brain, to broaden yeah. your, your scope of understanding to yep. know that that's possible for you. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book I'd recommend as well called The Magic of Big Thinking mm. uh, by David Schwartz. Very great book, very, very good book. And, and a lot of it boils down to, to how, we, how we position ourselves involuntarily. Mm -hmm. The way we wake up in the morning, the way we dress, the way we carry ourselves, the way we yeah. look, the, what, what, we, you know, what we focus on, all of those things yeah. shape the way we view our world and ultimately our world as we perceive it determines yeah. the lid on our potential yeah. and so to your point you man you're right so we need five dollars we should go like from <laughs> what is it five then from five to ten uh every yeah. friday night uh yes jesus comes back we gonna, uh, but, we gonna get something going for folks yeah but but i but i seriously think that that this concept of foresight is so mm -hmm. major i, I want to live yeah. in with this story uh, yeah. i know the time's almost up yeah. But I, I'll never forget moving here, moving to Murfreesboro. I was just, I was new at the church. And, you know, the first responsibility was to find a place to live. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at an apartment and, you know, just for a temporary window. And I saw this apartment I wanted. It was three bedrooms, fireplace. This place was gorgeous. But I didn't feel like I made enough money mm -hmm. to get the apartment. And I'll never forget going back to my mentor and saying, you know, I, I think I'm going to get a two bedroom, but I really like this three bedroom. She said, well, why don't you get the one you like? Yeah. I said, man, I don't think I make enough money. And she sits me down and she says, the issue is not the money. You have a poverty mindset. Wow. Here, here's the kicker. <laughs> so she prays over me and she, she says, you know, you got to, you got to, she gives me a book called Prosperity by uh, Fillmore, old, okay. old, old book. Uh, but when she speaks this to me, she prays over me and she says, boy, go get the apartment you want. Interestingly enough, 
I go and secure the apartment. Now I'm, I'm a little nervous because you know I don't know if I have the money and all of that. Yeah, yeah. It turns out I had miscalculated my income, and I actually made <laughs> more than enough to get the apartment. But because well... my mind had a lid on it, and my foresight and my insight and my yeah. perceptions were shortchanged. Yeah. I was going to walk into less than I was supposed to become. Right. And, and I just, I leave that by saying there's some people that are, that your businesses are less than they're supposed to become. Yeah. Entrepreneurial pursuits, less than they're supposed to become. Corporations, less than they're supposed to become. Yeah. Just because we have allowed our minds to block the very moral agenda that's been screaming from our guts and our hearts. Right, right. And so whether it's racism, whether it's, it's the expansion of a business, whether it's the pursuit of certain goals. Yeah. We be very careful to guard our foresight and let our moral authority gauge and determine the goals of our foresight yeah. instead of allowing our sometimes logistical thinking or, or m- meticulous um, analysis that leads to paralysis mm, to keep us from yeah. becoming uh, the best version of ourselves and, and right. seeing God, his full will done in our lives. Right. And Thank you. Thank you again. I want to also add to that just by a little bit of captioning again from uh, Pillar 5, which is foresight, which we focused on a lot today, especially because of what's going on with the pandemic, what's going on with race relations in the world today, wanting people to really tap into that skill set. And according to this book, the servant leader imagines possibilities. Mm. anticipates Mm. the future and proceeds with the clarity of purpose. So I want to encourage you guys, servant leadership will literally serve you both at home and at work. You have to live with purpose. And when you are living in purpose, you begin to find yourself living in peace. We're not saying Mm. that there won't be any challenges. We're not saying that it won't be hard, but there is such thing as peace Mm. in the midst of each storm. So I want you guys to join us. We will be back. Pastor McCarroll is coming back. (laughs) And next week, Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are going to be talking again about servant leadership. And guess what the title is, Pastor McCarroll? Go for it, go for it. Ultimate Sacrifice. So get ready, get ready, get ready. I am so excited. And if you have any questions, if you would like to get in touch with uh, Pastor McCarroll or myself, please feel free. We're going to make sure that on all of our playbacks that we have the links to his sites. And as you guys know, you can always get in touch with him if you're able to uh, check in with me as well at www.officialspconsultinggroup.com. This is Dr. Turan, and you are listening and watching this time, The Pop Podcast by Dr. Turan. Till next time, you all take care. Thank you, Pastor McCarroll. We can't wait for you to join us next week, Friday. All right. Take care.